Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Michael Casey. Okay, welcome back. So as we've been telling you, uh, this year we're doing something different at Consensus. We're doing something we're calling the Consensus at Consensus Report. And part of that is we're having these workshops, convenings, different sized gatherings of people from a cross section of stakeholders within the community to get together and address specific, polemical, kind of thorny issues. Privacy, you know, uh, law enforcement, crypto's image, various things like that. So there was a charrette, as we call them, a, a brief 25-person uh, gathering this morning, uh, the title of which was, you know, can and should DeFi defy the regulators? Um, and to come out, to give us a bit of a, uh, some of the takeaways from this morning's discussion, please welcome Brian Klein, who's a partner at Waymaker, and Perry Ann Boring, the founder and CEO of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Over to you guys. Thank you, Michael. Hi, I'm Perry M. Boring. I'm the founder and CEO of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We're a trade association representing uh, digital asset and blockchain innovators based in Washington, DC. And good morning, my name is Brian Klein. I'm a partner at Waymaker. We're a litigation boutique based in Los Angeles. We represent lots of people in this space, both in civil, criminal, and regulatory defense. So as Michael mentioned, this morning we convened a small group of DeFi innovators, operators, developers, policy makers, and legal minds to discuss. Um, Probably too many legal minds. A lot, lot of lawyers <laughs> uh, to discuss some of the biggest issues for, for decentralized finance. And a lot of them are, are legal and they're, they're policy in nature. So the first, uh, prompt that we debated was what is the likely outcome for the industry uh, given the current state of play of policy making here um, in the United States and part of the premise we were debating is is it going to stay here is it going to go overseas and if so what are some of the jurisdictions that are more friendly towards this space um, I would say really the, 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 the most pressing issue that keeps me, at night, up, me up at night and has been for a long time is the fact that in the United States, we have been highly critical and skeptical of this technology. Policymakers have, and there's a big focus on enforcement, and it's, it's driving innovation across the entire space, the entire crypto industry, but especially DeFi out of the United States. And so if we think long term, what does that mean? I have a deep conviction that blockchain technologies are going to be the rails that fuel the digital economy 10, 20, 50 years from now for the next generation. It's what we're going to use to transfer things of value, to transact in a digital economy. And if that is not being built here by American innovators, by American businesses, if that IP doesn't stay here for the benefit of the American economy, that could have national security implications, it could have economic security implications, um, and it, it, it potentially could also impact the world reserve status of the United States dollar. If we're not the leading and the dominant economy, that's gonna impact our monetary system. So these are big picture issues, um, but there was a lot of consensus on that point in the yeah, I think workshop. I think the consensus was people are gonna to try to be as decentralized from the start in a DeFi project, and people are gonna to try to do as much offshore as they can, and by offshore, outside of the United States. It's what's already happening. Yes. It is already happening, and that's the scary thing. Um, and right I, oh. Yeah, I would say last time I was in New York, when we were coming out of like the COVID stupor, and I was catching up with all my lawyer friends, I had so many people tell me that a big part of what they're focused on is helping projects domicile outside, American innovators, domicile everything they're doing outside of the U.S. to protect them from this hostile environment here. And then the second question we addressed was, what's the pathway of enforcement that's happening? What are people seeing? And I think the consensus, no pun intended, was that the U.S. regulators are taking the lead. It's a continuation of um, regulation by enforcement and that they seem to be generally trying to identify centralized actors, so for example, a centralized exchange or a bank and 
directing their enforcement efforts there because they're easily identifiable. Um, I don't know what your thoughts were on that. That was sort of, I thought, the takeaway. Right, so uh, a couple points there. So any point of centralization in a DeFi project or protocol, that's, that's where enforcement actions are going to be focused. Um, so two of the things that we also discussed is like, well, what regulator is it going to be? And in the United States, we obviously have this barrage of public policymakers and regulators all vying for jurisdiction from SEC and CFTC, Fed and FinCEN and IRS and so on and so forth. But the two that really stood out kind of rose to the top that we're most concerned about is one, the SEC, their proposed rule of you know, what is considered an exchange, these amendments to 3, 3B16 um, that you know, essentially say any group of people that are working together, whether or not they're working in a company or they're working as a collective, that triggers our laws. Um, and triggers the securities laws. And that's really a huge concern to so many people in this space. Um, and a lot of lawyers in the room and a lot of operators are also looking for ways to challenge that. How do we push back against that? Is there a litigation strategy? You know, what is the lobby strategy? And how do we address this beyond submitting comments like so many of us have already done? Um, and then the second regulator that you know, I think really rose to the top was FinCEN and Treasury. AML um, and sanctions, Bank Secrecy Act, uh, compliance. Uh, and what's, uh, that kind of had kind of a two sides of the argument. On one side, it's there is this um, big focus from regulators to want to track and trace everything for illicit, to track illicit finance. Um, and in DeFi, there's unique challenges to doing that. But the other side of the conversation that really came out in today's conversation that I thought was interesting is that this industry actually has an opportunity, or I should say that this community has an opportunity to work closely with law enforcement because of the unique capabilities of blockchains. And they've done that. And they, we have a lot of good will of doing that. Uh, but these national security arguments that go that are all about these illicit finance programs um, are um, important to policymakers and, and regulators, and that's much harder to finesse or work around. You really have to work together, I think, to be successful in addressing those concerns from the regulators. And I think, you know, in my own practice, we've seen post FTX, the SEC is doubled down on everything, become much more active, and also OFAC and FinCEN. So I think, again, that was tracking. There were a lot of lawyers in the room with a lot of experience representing companies, founders, projects. Um, so I think that is definitely, you know, agreeing with our own agreement. But I think the last question was focused on, and again, in this DeFi-centric uh, workshop was, do we need a new regulatory framework or should we be adapting existing frameworks, legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks for the industry? And I think there, you know, there was a lot of push and pull on this one. I think there is a general view that a lot of the existing laws don't work. They don't capture everything that DeFi does, not surprisingly. Um, just like when the internet first launched, you know, the laws didn't perfectly mesh with that. Um, but also, a resistance necessarily to a new framework that might just bog things down. So you might need discrete frameworks and adapting existing laws, um, but sort of like let's go slow um, and let's back off from the regulation by enforcement, uh, which, which is happening Posture. now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, kind of two points uh, to be made there on should we, you know, can we use the existing like regulatory framework and apply it to this new technology of DeFi? A lot of support from, for that across the community. Um, however, it needs to be tailored and it also has to take into account the unique capabilities of blockchain technologies like smart contracts as just one obvious example. Um, two, because the industry and uh, well, because DeFi in general is still so nascent, there's not a ton of applications that are out in market today. It needs the opportunity to grow and evolve before we start putting it into any type of regulatory buckets or boxes. So it needs room to grow. Um, and then uh, the question of should we have a whole new regulatory framework? Uh, can we just kind of <laughs> scrap everything that exists and build something unique for DeFi? A lot of people do support that. 
Um, although today there's not. I think everyone agreed that that's very unlikely to happen. But it's <laughs> unlikely to happen, right? That the, the policy efforts happening in Washington and other power centers around the country and the world, um, that's not what they're focused on. So to kind of you know get everyone focused on building a whole new framework, um, that would be a significant undertaking uh, to, to, to do. Um, but there was also a lot of support for a self-regulatory organization. Um, this is a point that's come up a lot. There's been a lot of different attempts to bring SROs to market. If you look across market oversight across different industries that are regulated by the SEC and the CFTC, most have SROs as a part of the structure. Um, and that's something that's also very absent in the conversation today with policymakers. There's not really any coordinated effort to, to bring an SRO through the legislative uh, process, but the industry and the community seems very supportive of that as well. Yeah, and I think just for the takeaways for everybody, you know, we're at DeFi helped fuel, fuel the last boom, and we're at a real inflection point in terms of what's happening with regulation, what's happening with enforcement. There's a lot of uncertainty, um, and I think a lot of exciting things are going to happen in the next year or two. Um, yeah, I know we were talking about that. Like, what is going to be, like, that takes us through the next era of adoption. Uh, so, you know, DeFi was a big one. We had the whole ICO boom a couple of years ago. You know, what's it going to be this year or next year? I think it's just people. Yeah. At the end of the day, what makes a network powerful is the amount of people that use it. And once something reads a network effect, it's incredibly difficult to contain this. And we've seen this with all technologies across the millennia. I think it's up to us to decide which technologies we want to use, which technologies we want to onboard to, and the more people we can bring into this community uh, to, to operate in a digital economy and a financial system that's more equal and transparent and accessible to all, uh, that's going to push us through a lot of these regulatory issues because what happens on the ground is the communities that ultimately drive the discussions that are happening in Washington. So I think we, the people, have a lot of power in achieving these network effects. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we're around if you want to talk more about DeFi.